Welcome. I want to say uh, hello to everyone who's joining us today for the City Council business meeting. Um, we're thawing out and it's good to see everybody's faces. Hopefully you're recovering from the big storm last week. Um, here to start us with our meeting invocation today is Greg Dow from Central Church of Christ. Greg, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Mayor. It is always an honor to lead a prayer for our city. I'd like to offer a prayer this morning that first considers those who are still struggling, who are suffering either from COVID or this recent weather event, and then a, a prayer in gratitude for our city leaders, and then a, a, a prayer for this season of Lent. So if you would bow with me, please. Father, we pray that you comfort those who are suffering, those who have suffered illness, experience death in their family, those who are dealing with economic struggles. Father, our prayer is for mercy for them. Please have mercy. Spirit, we reach out to you and we want to lift up our city officials and we pray that you fill them with courage, discernment, and compassion. Father, we are thankful for their leadership, especially during these times. And then Jesus, you have known us from the beginning of time. You have known us in the depths of our dreams and in the darkness of our shame. You know us as your beloved. Help us to own this core identity more and more in this season of repentance and mercy. Give us the rock-solid assurance of your unfailing faith in us as we seek the same in you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Greg. We really appreciate your coming to start our meeting off. Thank you. Moving on to the next item on our agenda is an announcement about a new employee. Mr. City Manager. All right, Mayor, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have with us today on the call, and I had to find my bio, uh, Stephanie Rodarte Shuto. She is the new Assistant Director of uh, Community Development. Uh, she's got a bachelor's degree in communications from WT. Uh, she spent 17 years in the classroom teaching and coaching speech and debate. Uh, and during the summer, she coordinated the Independence Day celebration events for the Canyon Chamber of Commerce. So she's a local person. She knows our people. She, she's grown up here. Uh, she's educated here and she's worked here uh, beyond her professional pursuits. Uh, she's a proponent for others through her involvement in local and national organizations and through coordination of advocacy events that engage, give voice to, and educate the public about human issues. Uh, she brings a passion for people to the city of Amarillo, to our organization, uh, and to every mission that the community development the department does. It's gonna be a huge resource to Jason Rillsberger and the rest of the team there. So I uh, just wanted to say, and I'm, there she is right there, Stephanie, welcome uh, to the organization. Uh, Council, please uh, feel free to uh, say hi. And uh, uh, Stephanie, do you have anything to say before we do that? Just, I'm so grateful to be here and I'm excited for the opportunity to work with the community development department and to make a really positive impact in the city. So thank you so much. Awesome. Welcome. welcome. Agreed. Yes. I, this, well, these are the moments I wish we were really wish we were still doing in person meetings because we do all want you to feel welcome here and uh, we love having another another WT buff on staff. Um, that's great. So the work y'all are doing at CDBG is so important, and we just appreciate that work. And uh, <clears throat> we're glad to have you, Stephanie. Yes. Stephanie. Welcome, Stephanie. Welcome to Amarillo. All right, well, um, moving on then to the public address portion of our meeting today, I'll ask the call host, Stephanie, do we have anybody who's registered for public address? Mayor, we did not have anybody sign up today. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so moving on to agenda item 1A is reviewing the agenda for the regular meeting and any of your attachments. Council, do you have questions just on the front end about anything that was in your packet? I've got a question about uh, something that's on our consent agenda with regard to um, 
we've got a second reading for the illegal dumping ordinance. And I've had um, a citizen ask me what would be our approach in issuing those citations. So <clears throat> their concern was if their alley gets dumped in, are they as the homeowner now liable to be cited because the alley is dirty, even though they didn't do the dumping illegally? Um, so I wonder, Jared, do you have some response to that? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the, the purpose of this ordinance is to facilitate and enable uh, the city to cite the people that are doing the dumping, not the person with the, with the dumping that happens to be behind their house, because we have no way to demonstrate that that person did it. <clears throat> our, our ordinances already would provide us the ability, if we so chose, to cite those people, but we know that they didn't do the illegal dumping in almost every case. So what this does is enable the city to enforce against the person that actually does the dumping. And that's why we've installed in, in, a, number of in a number of our alleys uh, 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 cameras that can pick up that activity taking place. <clears throat> and, and we will be able to move those to different locations. But the entire purpose of this ordinance is to uh, enable the city to uh, uh, enforce illegal dumping on the people that are doing the illegal dumping, not the person that receives the illegal dumping. Okay, that's good clarification. Um, I thought that was the answer, but I thought it was important for us to go ahead and address that. Um, and Mayor, um, I just wanted to add that, you know, it's one of the reasons why the city hasn't taken steps in the past to have an ordinance to actually impose fines because it is hard to identify who was actually responsible and not just the location. So it really goes hand in hand with the implementation adding um, the cameras that makes us able to actually identify um, who, who the lawbreakers were and attach it to the, to the right individual. Good, thank you. Okay. Any other, if there's nothing else, we'll move on then to agenda item 1B, a coronavirus update. Mr. Miller. Hey, Mayor. Uh, we've got our director of public health, Casey Stoughton, to give us the latest on what's going on at uh, public health. Uh, we have received our, our, our allocation of, uh, well, Casey, why don't you tell us everything that's going on at public health? I mean, at uh, the, uh, with regard to coronavirus. Sure. I can. Um, as Jared was saying, we have received our vaccine allocation for this week. So to this morning, we received another 5,000 first doses and our 5,000 second doses that we expect. So um, we will be giving vaccine um, to those people who qualify. So if you're in 1A, 1B, please come see us. Um, and we'll talk about all of those numbers and everything. We have a lot of numbers to talk about. So get ready. Um, a lot of numbers to talk about today. Um, we'll try to make it quick and smooth, but there will be some numbers. So as of Monday, there were a total of, I'm sorry, as of this morning, there were a total of 39,933 total cases of COVID-19 reported in Potter and Randall counties, 16,791 cases in Potter County, and 16,142 cases in Randall County. We have a total of 31,406 recoveries and we are up to 670 deaths reported in our community. That leaves us with 857 active cases. So our active cases are now down below 1,000. Um, each of the cases do represent a unique individual. Yesterday, our GA32's hospitalization percentage was at 6.1%. That means that 6.1% of all hospitalized patients have COVID-19. Our RAC region is no longer considered an area of high hospitalization, and we have moved to status level orange. However, to maintain these levels and to remain at these levels, we must remain vigilant, wearing our masks, socially distancing, um, and staying, staying home when we're sick, good hand washing, and being vaccinated when your group is called is the only way that we will stay at this level. Locally, there are 46 people hospitalized with COVID-19. Adult bed utilization is at 73.5%. ICU utilization is at 65%. And ventilator utilization is at 22.5%. The rolling seven-day positivity rate is currently at 4%. 
and the positivity rate at the drive through testing site, which is a subset of the total, is at 22%. The five-day new case average is 49 new cases per day. So the numbers are definitely trending in the right direction. Um, couldn't be more pleased about that. Definitely can't let our guard down. Um, masking is, is just as important as ever, um, as, long, as well as those vaccinations and the other public health measures that have been in place. As far as public health operations go, the public health drive-through testing site does remain operational. Individuals can call 378-6300 to be screened and directed to the test site. We have reduced the hours at the test site from um, to instead of eight to three, we're now running eight to noon so that we can pull those staff over to the vaccination clinic to help with staffing there. Um, the outpatient Bamlanivimab infusion center is, is operational and accepting referrals from local providers for patients who do meet that EUA criteria. And we have seen so far 148 patients requiring, only, and only four of those patients have required hospitalization. The vaccination clinic is also operational. And to date, Emerald Public Health has given 41,268 first doses and 19,823 second doses of the received 76,950 total doses. Today we'll be open until seven. So like I said, if you're in one of those 1A or 1B groups, like a healthcare worker, someone who's 65 and or older, or someone who's 18 and over with a chronic healthcare condition, please come see us. If um, someone's coming for their second dose, as a reminder, please bring their card. I know we've had a lot of numbers so far, but just a few more, so hang with me. Um, we do, we have some provisional data on our vaccination clinic. Our, we have a lot of data sources that we're working through and our staff are doing QI. So provisionally, 77% of the vaccine has been given to people who have a Potter Randall address who live in, the, in Potter or Randall County. 93% of the vaccine has been given to people who live in the Texas Panhandle and only around 6% of the vaccine has been given to people who live outside of the Texas Panhandle. So definitely we're vaccinating um, people who live right here at home. Um, you know, Amarillo is certainly the um, capital of the Panhandle and we're really glad to be able to, to serve our entire um, community, you know, outside of, of Amarillo itself, but certainly vaccinating people who live right here at home. I expect the numbers to adjust slightly as additional data is added and QI is completed or is, is continuous. We always do QI. Um, with all of that information, the take home message is that we are thankful. We're thankful for the support of our community. They have come to be vaccinated and are supporting our team in big ways. We have had incredibly generous donations, um, gifts of gratitude, snack pack for snack pack, young bloods, the Big Texan Faith Builder Sunday School class at Hillside Christian Church, Amarillo National Bank, Happy State Bank, and individuals who have provided donuts and water and snacks um, between the generosity of our community and the hardworking dedication of our city staff. That's what makes our Amarillo Clinic so successful and Amarillo itself so successful. So I just want to say thank you to our community and don't forget your mask when you get out of the car. So lots of good things happening. And that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. Casey, on the topic of masks, would you clarify, because I, I have had citizens say, we're no longer required to wear masks, right? Now that we're in yellow. Would you talk about that? And just how I know the message is confusing. We've changed back to yellow, but where does that leave us under the governor's orders? And what should citizens be doing if they're indoors, wear a mask or not wear a mask? Yes, and, and just want to make to clarify, we're in orange. Oh, I said yellow, sorry. Yes, thank That's you for okay. that. That's okay. Yeah, so we're in orange, and so yes, we still definitely need to wear a mask. And so if you're inside, definitely wear a mask. If you're outside and you're within six feet of somebody else, or and even if, you know, if you're within in a closed space um, and, and you're still, you know, that distance is, is six feet, but you're in a closed space, like a room, it's a good idea to still have your mask on. Um, so definitely wanna wear your mask. 
um, socially distancing and good hand washing are super important. But yes, the mask requirement has certainly not gone away. The governor's order still, um, the, I think it's GA 29 is still in effect. So we still have to wear our masks. And then we still have the, um, just the, 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 the requirements in place to, to wear our masking. Thank you. Other questions for Casey? Elaine, I see you talking, but I, we can't hear you. I do that all the time. And I, Ms. Hey, Trying that have fancy a, little, uh, you know, space bar trick that Eddie showed me and it wasn't working. Yeah. Um, but my question, Casey, was on the GA-29, that governor's order, um, did that have any connection to numbers? Or is it's just a blanket statewide mask mandate, isn't it? And it has nothing to do with our numbers or what color code we may be at as a city. Right, it's just it is in effect. It doesn't. It doesn't. It, it is not tied to a metric, which is appropriate. I mean, you know, it's it, the the virus doesn't know what what number we have assigned to it or what color we have assigned to it, and so you know we still need to wear our masks so that we so that we don't we don't move back and forth between our our assigned numbers and colors, um, and, you know, I think they certainly give us a situational awareness about where we are in our community, but we can so easily slip back into those higher levels if we don't take the precautions. So then a question with our vaccination hours this week. So today's Tuesday, and so just for the rest of the week, do you mind restating kind of the hours that the Civic Center is open? And I know that kind of depends upon how many people show up. If with, with the number we have of um, the 5,000 doses that arrive for first doses, do you think that will last based on what y'all have seen on demand through the end of the week? Yes, and that 5,000 doses, um, that's just what we received this morning, but we still have, you know, a few, some doses left over. So that, we just added that to our, um, the, the doses that we currently had in our refrigerators and freezers. And so we are sitting pretty well this week. Um, we, so today, um, Tuesday, we'll be open until seven. And then the rest of the week, um, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we'll be open from nine until 5 p.m. here at the Civic Center. And you can come in entrance three. And that's the very north entrance. And Casey, gonna, are you mind just repeating? Oh, I'm sorry, Eddie, go ahead. Oh, I was just, the only question that I had is, and it's a question that I bet Casey can't answer. So if she can, then she really is a rock star. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Casey. I just <laughs> I couldn't resist. My, I'm, my fingers are crossed. Okay. So we've got 33,000 cases in the city of Amarillo or in Potter Randall County. Um, and we've got 41,268 first time that have received their first vaccination. So about 33,000, how many of those, do you have any idea how many people have come through that have had COVID that, are, that have taken the vaccination? You know, I can't answer that question exactly. Um, you're right. That's a tough one. Um, we'd have to do some um, serious um, data overlay, yeah. but I do know that we have had some. So that's a great question that people have asked us. Um, they've asked, you know, well, I've had COVID. I don't need the vaccine or I've had COVID. Can I get the vaccine? And the answer is yes. Um, so the current guidance says that if you have had COVID, you can defer your vaccine for up to 90 days, but you don't have to. So you can be vaccinated if you're in that 1A or 1B group. You can be vaccinated as soon as you have recovered, you're outside of your um, isolation quarantine period, and you're no longer contagious. Um, there's not a minimum, that minimum time is just after recovery but you can defer for up to 90 days because you would have some of that protection, that natural protection left 
but you do not have to. Well, uh, the only reason I'm kind of asking that is because, you know, that whole thing ends up coming up, you know, you, you start talking about herd immunity. And so if nobody that's had COVID is getting vaccinated, um, then that 41,000 plus 33,000 is basically accounts for about 29% of the Potter Randall potential population of 255,000. And I know that that's an unrealistic figure, but you know, I know that there's always that talk about when does that point come when we finally reach her uh, immunity and that's somewhere between 70 and 85%. Um, and so I was just curious if there was, I, I know that would be a, that would probably be a pretty big question to be asking everybody that walked in, but I was just curious if you had any ideas. Yeah, it's probably like a Venn diagram. Um, you know, there's there's probably some you know some overlay of that of those two circles. Um, it just kind of depends on how big that that middle circle is or where where that overlay is. Um, so that was just a speculative question. So thanks for humoring me for the moment. Stacey, do you know what percentage of our population that falls in the high risk category has been vaccinated as opposed to looking at our full population, looking at the uh, breakdown per, per age group? So I would have I would have to look and see, you know, get and get kind of all of those numbers. Um, but right now, all of the people that have been vaccinated would be in that high risk group. Um, you know, they're all health, either healthcare workers, people over 65, or people who have a chronic health care condition. So they should all be um, in that high risk group. Right. So I guess if um, maybe like in two weeks of just uh, gathering that number of what that is on the percentage of the whole group in that. Sure. So you make a great point. It's like right now, 100 percent of that group falls in the high risk. And to find out kind of what percentage of our high risk group, I'm hoping it's pretty high that the, the percentage of our high risk group, we're getting, you know, a pretty high percentage that has been covered. Mm -hmm. And, and then I think, just our, I, th I think our all we've been able to do to date in with regard to estimating how many people do we have in our two county area in our public health district fall into categories 1a and 1b that's an estimate because there's a lot of that we don't know you know we don't know how many people not 65 and older uh, uh, you know present with underlying medical conditions so we've kind of estimated the number of 1a's and the number of 65 plus uh, Mayor, I think we had that roughly at I about 57,000 coming off the DSHS website. So 67,000 roughly. So we can calculate as a function of that number what the number of first vaccinations that we've given uh, is as a percentage. And I'll look to see if they've updated any of that information. A follow up to um, something that that Eddie was bringing up. Something I learned at the uh, blood drive last week was that um, they are definitely looking for individuals who have already had COVID and have not been vaccinated yet. That to be able to donate the convalescent plasma, you have to fall in that category to have had COVID but not taken your vaccine yet. So to our community, if you fall in that range, it's a very niche um, area that they are, are looking for donations. And then Casey, would you just give us an update on what are the requirements? Um, the state of Texas has chosen to set up a hub model for vaccinating the, the population. What are the requirements for being a hub and how does that affect who we can turn away or residency requirements for vaccines? Absolutely, that's a great question. So um, the hub providers agree to vaccinate people in that 1A and 1B category. They vaccinate, they agree to vaccinate people regardless of where they live. And they vaccinate equitably in the hardest hit areas and demographics, use all of the doses each week and promptly report the doses administered. 
Okay, thank you. And we are a hub clinic, right? Just want to clarify that. Yes, ma'am, we are a hub clinic. And we have, um, you know, all of those things we are trying to do um, to the very, you know, and we are successful in doing all of those things. Um, I think it's amazing to know that the promptly reporting the doses administered into MTRAC, you know, we have a team of, of people who are entering all of that data and they're, we have a, a you know a 24 hour deadline to get all of that entered and they're they're really keeping up with it so they're getting everything entered um, usually within 24 sometimes 36 hours but we are we really have a fast turnaround time on data entry have we had to waste any of our vaccines just you know it gets to be the end of the day and no, so we have um, with our banding system and the way that we are um, counting and uh, um, accounting and tracking everything, then we really, we try to use everything uh, or we do use everything before the end of the clinic day. So just to clarify, we have not had to throw away or waste any vaccines that we've been sent. No. That's great. Uh, one more question um, on the RAC nurses. So I know that that number is dropping, the, the number of rec nurses that we have. Uh, but I know every morning when I drive, I go by the, I basically go by the UA Cinema and there's, you know, there's like 10 buses that are there that are basically for the rec nurses. And so there's still, there's not near as many buses as there were before. So I, I assume we still have some rec nurses here. Is that about to go away? Do we know what the governor has planned on that or... Is, is his office in charge of where those go? How does all of that end up working? Where do we stand with that? So those are, that, those are great questions too. These nurses are assigned to us through um, BCFS, a disaster um, response team. And so they're assigned through a little bit of a different route than just straight through the rack. And so we, we are working with the state on their continued um, mobilization through us. And so we, we have tw the 25 and we anticipate they're, um, they're staying with us for at least a little while. Um, you know, they they're on two week assignments. And so we re-request re that um, every, every, at least every two weeks, if not longer. And so we've been very fortunate and we really appreciate the state's support in that area. So you've got 25 that work the vaccination clinic, and then there's a large number that are actually working the hospitals, right? Do right, you know, and there's we know where that is. No, so the RAC nurses, um, they have their, they have been working on demobiliz demobilization of that group, and I think that over the last three weeks that they have reached what their intended target was, and so they're going to kind of slow down a little bit on demo, but. Um, the nurses that are assisting us is through BCF, BCFS. And so it's a little bit of a different um, channel. Okay. Any other questions for Casey? Howard? Yes. Um, I'll try to stump you like Eddie did. <laughs> <laughs> what the, uh, do you know the it's it's voluntary to get a vaccine? Do you know what percentage are not wanting to be vaccinated? Um, y'all are really asking tough questions. I, I don't know that. Um, I think that you know as time moves on, um, I think that people who may have been a little hesitant at the very beginning, like it may be in December or January are seeing the success of the vaccine and, um, and it's, it's safety and it's efficacy is really playing out. And so my hope is that people who have been hesitant will decide when their group is called or now that their group has been called since we're in the 1B category that they will choose to be vaccinated. Um, I know I breathed a kind of a sigh of relief whenever I received my second dose. And so um, I'm still gonna wear my mask. Um, I don't sleep in it, but it's close. Um, but, I, but I did just kind of breathe a sigh of relief whenever I got my second dose. And so 
I know that I, I want that for other people, um, for them to be protected because it's so important. You know, we've lost 670 people in our community and that is 670 too many. Um, and so I, I want that same protection for, for everyone here in our community. Well, you did good on answering that. Let me ask you another question. After we get 98% of the people that want to be vaccinated that are in 1A and 1B, are we going to go to the other people between less than 65? That's a great question, too. The state, the EVAP team, the um, expert vaccine allocation panel is um, is working on that now on what 1C will look like. And um, I don't, I think it will look more like a wave as opposed to like a hard stop. Um, so, you know, kind of once, like at some point, you know, they'll kind of look like waves of different, of different groups as opposed to like we have, we have to get to a certain point and then we can move on to the next group. Um, but there's 8.4 million Texans that are in group 1B. And so there is, um, you know, there's a lot of folks that do qualify. And so um, I know that the EVAP committee is working on that definition of what 1C will look like. And so when it's, um, when that information has been published and um, the state of Texas is ready to move on to that 1C category, um, I know that we'll be ready to serve and uh, we hope that we have a lot of people in that 1C group who are ready to be vaccinated. So does this group that you have, that you're on this, the evaluation committee, so, you know, you read stuff in the paper all the time, or I, I'm going to use the word the paper. I, I don't, I, I don't know the last time I actually saw a physical newspaper, but um, <clears throat> in all the different things that you, that you can read. Um, so I've seen that Kentucky and Oregon both are starting to vaccinate their uh, teachers. And I know that that's outside of the 1A1B deal. And so uh, I assume that that would probably be 1C, but you guys will have that opportunity if, because that, that's one, you know, I've, I, see, I see teachers coming into my office all the time and uh, talking about it. And I, and I know that if they're not, if, if they don't have a comorbidity that gets them in the door, you know, I, I've got a, a number of them that are chomping at the bits, just waiting for that opportunity. Uh, because like, I was like you, when I got my second one, I breathed the sigh of relief because I knew that I felt, you know, relatively protected at this point in time, actually better than relatively protected. I felt, I felt really good about my protection. And so, and I know that they're kind of waiting for that. So are you guys going to be given, are you guys given that kind of leeway of saying, okay, yeah, we're going to make for sure the teachers are like at the top of 1C, just as soon as we get that part of it, they're going to become available. Is that the kind of thing that you all will have control over? So the discussions are very robust. Um, you know, everyone on the team has, um, has an opinion and has right. the ability to, um, to advocate and to share that. It's a, it's, it has been a really great team um, and, a, and a great um, committee to serve on because every does have, like, has, has that opportunity to share why they think and why they believe that, um, you know, that a certain, um, a certain decision should be made. It also, we come together and we, we vote and we, we make those decisions in a very fair and democratic way. And so it's nice that, um, that, that it, the committee is, is it's a larger group. So it's not, uh, and it's a very wide, there's a wide range of people on that committee. And so there's a lot of perspective and a lot of science so it's, there's, we're you know, trying to very closely follow the epidemiology of, of, the, of the pandemic and what is happening in Texas and what's happening across the country. Um, and so really trying to follow all of that science and then um, to know kind of where, where that supply needs to go next. And so it's really been good to be part of that group and to be part of the team that, um, can advocate for different um, pieces of that puzzle. So it's not been easy, but it has been good. Well, in that, in that light, 
I just want to tell you that I am so grateful you're on that committee. Um, I love your heart. Uh, I, I love that your mind and the way that you are thinking through these things and your compassion. And uh, I'm grateful that you're on that committee. Uh, and I, if everybody's got the same kinds of characteristics that you have, then I know that our decisions are going to be really well handled. And so, Casey, I just want to tell you, I'm very grateful for everything that you're doing. Thank you. Well said. Anything else? Okay, Casey, thank you. Jared, anything else on that? No, ma'am. Okay, hey, item 1C is to discuss animal management and welfare, a proposed breeders ordinance. Mr. City Manager. All right, Mayor, thank you. Uh, we have a, a, a draft uh, a breeders ordinance that has been through our animal management uh, board, uh, uh, advisory board. Uh, we have new, uh, well, I'll just call her director of animal management and welfare, uh, Victoria Medley. Because at some point you got to get rid of the new, so let's just do it now. <laughs> Victoria? Okay, um, and I think Stephanie has the PowerPoint. Okay, so um, we have met uh, twice and, and our interim director, uh, Rob Shearn was with us on both of those uh, initial meets with mm -hmm. our ad, uh, advisory board. And we have been able to kind of revise it, look at it and make a much more simplified, less kind of punitive type of ordinance. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion I think in the last few years about it so I think this one is is finally kind of hit the mark where we were really trying to address um, some of the issues that we were seeing um, basically with a breeders ordinance or the reason that we're needing one is the state law regulates large you know breeding type where there's a lot of animals operations but nothing regarding small breeding operations so this new one is gonna ensure that all the animals and the quality of um, life for our community are addressed at the same time. Um, you know, we understand that one part is uh, a person's business and, you know, they have some rights. And also, uh, and this ordinance also is gonna make sure that we're addressing like the physical, social and emotional health of the animals while understanding that well, respecting what was the expectations within our community. So um, I think the key thing here to understand, and I think there was a, a lot of discussion on what this breeder ordinance meant. This is key to um, who this is gonna affect. Um, the definition in the ordinance says, means a person who breeds dogs or cats and transfer possession of more than one litter or, or a part thereof in a 12 month period. I do know that, um, that our city hall and a lot of um, community outreach was going on regarding would this affect like our um, rescues or our, our, our fosters. And this clearly states it's people who breed for a purpose. So they've done it on purpose. It's not for those people who are fostering animals or our partners in that way. This doesn't affect them. Um, so with that, the requirements for this new breeders permit is that it'll be an annual fee of $100. And um, within that application and that fee permit, they're gonna have to have, give us a proposed location of where they're gonna breed it. So it's the actual location within our city limits. Um, they have to submit plans and designs that address indoor, outdoor cages, pens, and enclosed outdoor areas that we'll be able to review to make sure that it's appropriate size for the animals that they plan on breeding and that it's appropriate for the neighborhood that it's in. Um, applicant um, can't have surrendered any animals to us in the past two years. And really that's just on that professional level and accountability level to make sure that um, they have all the process within their, in, within their own business plan to make sure that they're treating the animals correctly and have medical care and the, the such. Um, you will also have cannot receive no more than three violations under chapter uh, two of our city ordinance in the last two years. Um, I do want to clarify the, that we came up with the three based on the idea that we understand there could be a chance that somebody's animal got out, their own personal animal. And a lot of times if those get out, um, they'll, 
that citation could be up to three violations just because maybe they didn't have their collar on or their tags off. So they get three. So we understand that that could happen at one point. Um, but if you have more than that in a two year period, um, there is some concerns being raised. Um, you also have to provide the vaccine certifications for animal. So if you have two adult animals within your, on your breeding or in your breeding location, we, they need to make sure and have all the proper certifications, medical certifications. And, it, and it's no less than what we would expect for our own local pet owners. Okay, Steph. Okay, so this is one thing and I, and I highlighted the word here is because the city and um, AMW is going to have the ability to uh, um, to revoke a breeder's permit, but when we say it's really clear that we need to under or people need to understand that they, we put the word may. So these are the reasons that we could revoke it. Doesn't mean we have to revoke it. You know, once again, we're really trying to focus on compliance and helping people um, instead of being punitive in nature. So if a breeder fails to update um, the information, you know, they've added more animals or they've taken down certain fencing, if they haven't let us know, they could get their permit um, revoked. Um, if dogs, cats, bark, howl, create noises that disturb the neighborhood, we also wanna make sure that whoever's gonna have this kind of breeding situation in that neighborhood that everyone in that community is also, um, we, we wanna make sure that that's fairly addressed to their neighbors. Um, also, we have indoor, if the indoor or outdoor areas for the dogs and cats are not maintained in a sanitary condition. This is probably one of the biggest things that AMW and our officers and our compliance manager look at. We have to assure that if there's, you know, puppies and, and those kinds of animals in any part of within our city limits that they are maintained in a sanitary, clean, and healthy environment. Um, if any person reports being scratched or bit by any of the dog or cats within it, and that once again, this is a May, and we just wanna make sure that we're um, being able to review and address and help any of the breeders that might be having issues. Um, and then finally, if, if you violate any provisions of um, our chapter 8-2, which includes everything that has with our to do with our animals. One of them being, um, you know, dangerous dog. If something got out and bit, some, bit somebody or the neighbors were having some kinds of issues, the, the dogs were loose, any of the, a number of any of those violations that could also cause us to revoke the uh, breeder's permit. So I made it quick. Um, kind of went through there fast because I know these meetings going every are, can go long. Is there any questions that any of you guys have regarding it? I'll say something real quick, Victoria. Sure. Okay, so sitting on the advisory board, <clears throat> here's some things that I that I would want everybody else that's on the council or for those here in Amarillo to hear out of this deal is, um, you know, one of the things that was very impressive about this particular ordinance, this breeder's ordinance, is just the fact that if you really read the ordinance pretty close, you find out that really the, the focus is on the animals, actually. Um, and what I mean by the focus is on the animals is I was very impressed to see you've got to have X, Y, and Z. Your cages have got to be a certain way. You've got to provide a certain amount of area. You've got to have a plan that's submitted for how these animals are going to be taken care of if you're going to be a breeder. And so it's, it's basically, you've got to submit a business plan. Uh, it means that you're serious about the breeding. Uh, it means that um, it's really going to be an up and up thing. Uh, the others that are on the advisory board uh, that are, some of them are involved with some of the rescues and different things. Um, they were very impressed with what is going on. Uh, as a matter of fact, the annual fee started at $25 and, and I didn't say a word about it at all, but very quickly, those that were on the advisory board said, no, that's not enough. Uh, number one, we need to make for sure that we're cover covering the cost that's required on that. And they're the ones that quickly moved it up to 50 and then on up to a hundred dollars. 
Um, and I think, um, I think from everybody that I've talked to, and I've got a couple of people that are involved with rescues that are in my practice, and one of them, uh, one of them I talked to within the past two weeks, and one of them has been a while since I've talked to her. But both of them, they were uh, saying that this is a cornerstone of something that we've got to have here in Amarillo, that we've got to figure out how we're taking care of our animals and the overpopulation. And this is a great point with which to start. Um, and that I was just incredibly impressed with the fact of this was really, do you have a business plan? If you're gonna breed dogs or cats, do you have a business plan? How are you gonna set this up? How are you gonna take care of the animals and uh, so I thought it was, it, it's really, it's pretty impressive. It really kind of sets, uh, it sets a standard for what we need to be doing. And there are a lot of other cities here in the state that already have a breeder's ordinance in place. And I think everything has been developed from looking at a lot of different plans. And so I think, honestly, we've got one of the best results out of this personally. Thank you. Go ahead, Elaine. Victoria, can you uh, give us some insight on kind of the community engagement up to this point? Uh, I know Eddie was talking about from the board and it sounds like definitely from the, the uh, animal side. Um, kind of where are we on communication with the breeders and have they had conversations and input into developing this ordinance as well? Um, well, Elaine, we did have two um, separate advisory board meetings that were very clear, that were open to the public for comment. Um, we didn't have anyone sign up for them, and they were posted. And as I said, we had them, we had both of them within this this year, so that we could really keep the momentum and keep the d discussion, knowing that once you hear something, sometimes you know things will fall off in a month or two months. Um, and so we were able to do that, and we didn't have any other um, comments inside of our advisory board meetings. And I do know that when we met with the um, rescue partners, that it was a discussion that came up with a rescue partner that uh, Rob had hosted, and I was there, um, that it came up about just how do we handle you know, people who are breeding and making them, holding them accountable so they're not doing it over and over in a year and not getting spayed or neutered and, and it coming back into the shelter. So I think the rescue um, partners that we had were really clear, as Dr. Sauer said, is saying this is just a foundational thing that we need for the health of our animals in our community. Do we know how many um, breeders this might impact? Do we know how many people are active? Have active right, and that's, right, and that's one of the problems is that we don't have any way right now at all to track it. You, we don't have a way, so we don't know what's in. Now we do have people who you know could have uh, kennels um, outside it with, if they're within our city, but that doesn't mean they're breeding. They could just you know be having a business that keeps um, animals over the weekend. So we really don't have any way of knowing what that's gonna look like until we put this into process and what'll give us a better idea and a better number. And it's really gonna help us strategically to understand what we have, what we're dealing with, instead of just, you know, supposing we think this out or thinking that this might be one of our culprits. So I think this is one of the things that are gonna be able to help us with that. I think you uh, opened your presentation talking about large versus small. Um, and I think you're talking about large operations and not yes. necessarily large animals or small yes. animals. Just wanted some clarification on that. No, that's how funny. Define large, how many uh, you know litters they might have or something like that. Right, so right now in the state of Texas, if I recall right, um, for large, it was ones that had 11 animals or more that they were breeding at a time that the state uh, that tech, that the state law refers to. Um, and so under that, there was really nothing there. And that was why when we looked at best practices, um, had looked at other cities and I'd call, been able to get a hold of ordinances from other cities. So we could kind of look and adjust and see what other people were doing in the best practices and seeing what was working. 
And so um, that's kind of where we came. Um, we were able to kind of cherry pick and fit what was best for our community and what was best that our advisory board felt good with. And so I think when Dr. Sauer was saying that, that was kind of the idea. Victoria, I really expect that um, these rescue groups will be, they really will be partners in helping us identify breeders and helping us um, educate citizens that this is a talking point change. Yes, it is a change. It's not so much a revenue generating change for the city. Um, it will take a while for it to even impact our animal population, but it is a great platform for us to educate people about spay and neutering their pets. Um, because it, it, even though it's worded toward people who have um, the intention of breeding their animals, it also will target all of us that own animals. Um, if we haven't spayed or neutered our animals, we should also do that. Um, do you agree that, that it, with this ordinance, we can move forward in partnering with those animal rescue groups better to begin to identify some of the people that Councilwoman Hayes was wisely asking about? Um, yeah, I think that's this is definitely that first step and just the idea that yes, we understand that people have a business model and they could be responsible people that have it. They're going to do their, you know, they're going to go through these processes. It's those ones who haven't where we're talking three or four, you know, um, litters in a year and trying to, to sell them and they can't sell them and they end up surrendering them to us. So I think it's really going to be able to open our eyes and see and give us another tool to educate and to help our, com our community partners let us know what's going on too, where we're communicating so that we can start really addressing this issue that animals got to be spayed and neutered or we're not going to get out of our issues with animals. And so Victoria, can you just talk to us about um, what are a citizen's avenues for getting their animal spayed or neutered and what's the most affordable because certainly that's a burden for all of us thinking about families that want to own a pet but maybe can't afford to get it spayed or neutered and is that a is that a service that we offer um, at the animal shelter and so, how, how do we price it so currently we we don't offer it actually at the shelter but we do have some local partners, veterinarians that'll get, that we are able to give um, a reduced fee to get your animal um, spayed and neutered. The other thing is, is when we're at, when if an animal is picked up and it's a stray or your dog just got loose and you wanna reclaim it, we do have some requirements regarding getting your animal spayed or neutered, what it's gonna cost and us giving them a better ability to get that done within a certain amount of time. So um, what I would tell you, you can call local vets to find out their prices. Also on our website, you can go to our information. We have some information in there regarding um, agencies and uh, vets that can provide um, services, not only um, spayed and neuter services, but also um, any kind of small medical needs that an animal might need and a person might be struggling getting them that service. Aaron Council, I also wanted to mention that uh, if anybody wants to, to share information or comment on this, uh, this is not the only opportunity. We're gonna have two readings of this, first and second reading. It'll be on the agenda twice, uh, for, for the next two meetings. Uh, uh, if unanimous, it won't necessarily be something that council discusses at the second meeting, but it is on the agenda and the public can comment on, on it on either one of those agendas. We definitely want to hear input. I know council wants to hear that input uh, if somebody has it. So I wanna make sure everyone knows that if there's any desire to address the council on it or to use all of the other myriad of ways that people can reach out to council, uh, either through uh, calls, internet, uh, uh, email, uh, our online reporting system. There's a lot of ways that people can share their thoughts on this uh, with council prior to council taking any votes. Victoria, is the new surgery center that we're opening up soon, um, is that something that you have a vision for the future would provide spay and neuter services to the public or that would only be used for animals that are picked up and, and being 
you know, adopted back out. And so favorite. currently, I mean, in, at the at the beginning of opening this, we're really definitely going to focus on um, the ones that we have within our custody, for the lack of a better term. And before we release release them, that we would be able to do it. But I can tell you, just from researching and looking at other agencies and looking at best practices, one of the things that would probably really help us and where we hope to head to is that everything, every animal that comes out of our shelter can be spayed and neutered. That, and that once we do through partnerships with local vets or with Texas Tech Vet School, that we would be able to provide some of that spayed and neutering to our community, our, our low income community or people who are just struggling understanding how to do that, where to do it. So yes, definitely long-term. I think that's one of the things that we could really look at and um, see our community partnership with, like I said, our local um, agencies and uh, the Texas Tech Bank School. And um, Mr. City Manager, can you tell us where this ordinance, where the public could go to, to review that, to be able to read it and um, uh, be prepared for those next two meetings where that would be posted? Victoria, can we, I don't know if it's posted on the AMW website or not. Do, Victoria, is that is that the case right now? It is not, but it can easily be posted onto our webpage. We'll get that posted up on the AMW webpage immediately or today, hopefully. And uh, we'll also have it available on the packets uh, for both of the upcoming meetings. Good question. Got one question. Yes, sir. Victoria. If, if we adopt this ordinance, what will this accomplish for the city one year from now, two years, five years, 10 years from now? So, um, you know, hopefully what we would look at and why we would want to do something like this is that within a year to two years that we have this level of accountability that people understand there is a difference between this being a business model and then people just for the lack of a better term, trying to make some quick money and dumping our community with unwanted puppies. So um, as we do this, is it within a year? Could I, could we say we'd see, you know, complete turnaround? Absolutely not. This, this problem has been created uh, for a very long time here in Amarillo regarding our space and neutering. This is just one of those tools to the step towards getting um, the education and holding some of our, our local um, citizens um, accountable. It also provides a framework, like, like Victoria said, for responsible breeders to do, to continue doing it. We don't, you know, the target of this is not responsible breeders. It does provide a framework for those responsible breeders to, to work, but it really more than anything else gives us the tools we need to be able to address the very irresponsible situations that we find in, in many backyard breeding situations where people are just, like, like Victoria said, breeding for a quick buck, not caring about the, the health or futures of the animals, not caring about the impact that they're having on our community or the uh, uh, challenges that that, that, that unrestricted uh, uh, irresponsible breeding has on the animal management and welfare center itself. Thank you. you know, from the way that I've kind of seen this is it's kind of like, we're going down this road and we've hit a Y and we've got to make a decision on which way we're going to go. And by doing this ordinance, it's kind of like, you know, that Y you can see the road next to you for a period of time. And it takes a while before there's enough separation that you go, oh, wow, we're going in a completely other direction. But I think this is one of these major Y's. It's a major fork in the road that we're coming up to that gives us the opportunity to help animal management and welfare go back to that position where we need for them to be. And Victoria, whenever, it sounds like we're gonna be seeing you again in a couple of weeks. And if possible at that time, before we would be voting on this ordinance, um, if we could get an update on the, just the numbers kind of uh, of the our per capita, I know in the past when we first began looking at this a couple of years ago, our surrender numbers for our population are just really high. 
And so just if we could just get kind of a little bit more current data of how our surrender numbers okay. compared to our population numbers to other cities. Um, yes, um, we can do that. And I would like to just remind to um, the council at any time or, or our citizens at any time they can go on our website and we have a daily report card that says exactly how many surrenders we have um, daily, be it surrenders that we get from out in the field or surrenders that we get at our public access office at, there at the shelter. So we can definitely pull those numbers, but like I'd say, um, that is something that anybody can, can view on a daily, daily basis. Any other questions for Victoria? Well, if she was new and shiny when she started today, I think we are beginning to break her in. And I, I don't think Victoria, none of us think of you as new and shiny. We think of you as experienced and dependable because you've been at the city for a, a long time and your leadership is strong and we're glad to have it at AMW. Um, it's a very important department in the city and um, you're casting a vision and executing great changes over there. So. We look forward to seeing this ordinance on our agenda for the next meeting. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, uh, next item then is item 1D, which is discussed Tri-State Master Plan. Mr. City Manager. Hi, Mayor, we have Andrew Freeman uh, to uh, Managing Director of, uh, managing, one of our Managing Director, our Managing Director, pardon me, to discuss the Tri-State Master Plan. Give, tell us where we're at uh, and where we're going timelines, things like that. We've had presentation to you previously. Uh, so this will uh, really be more of an update and y'all can certainly ask any questions you have uh, of him. I know the mayor is, is a key player in this as well. So the mayor, you, mayor, you may have uh, something to add on top of what Andrew has to share. Andrew? Yes, sir. So just a brief update on what's taken place since last month when city council initially discussed this idea. We have um, presented to Potter County and Amarillo ISD. Those meetings took place yesterday. Uh, we've also had additional meetings one-on-one -on -one with the Potter, Potter County judge uh, to discuss the idea. Uh, both meetings went really well. We had a lot of good feedback and interest uh, in the process and participating. Um, we're definitely going to be following up with an additional meeting with Potter County over the next few weeks, uh, they wanted some further discussion on funding um, and other planning efforts uh, to continue that conversation. Um, next steps, we will be having a follow-up meeting with the Tri-State Expo Board and Potter Avenue District Board uh, just to continue that dialogue uh, for their participation in the project. Um, I am also working with Emily Kohler on my staff to go ahead and start drafting an initial RFP, RFQ for us to start reviewing. Um, so once we get that finalized, we'll be able to move quickly to get that out uh, for people to bid on um, and show their interest so we can continue down the, down the process. And that will also help us finalize what the cost might actually look like so we can then uh, regroup with each entity to uh, formalize the participation uh, financially in that project. Um, so. Uh, things are moving uh, very well, and we're hoping to continue down that process uh, over the next month. I would just add that um, in going to do these meetings with the partners, uh, we clarify that the city doesn't own any property in that footprint, um, but we think it is a real opportunity for development in our city and a very real opportunity to bring economic um, development around that area in restaurants, retail, hotels. Um, it is a tourism um, generator in our city right now. Over 300,000 people visit the fairgrounds every year with the activities that we currently have planned and scheduled there and the work that the Venue District and the Tri-State Fair Expo do. Um, so they're already an economic generator in our city. What can we do to help them in the future be even more an economic generator, especially attracting tourism dollars um, for hot tax and self tax dollars, because anything we can do to alleviate the burden uh, on property owners um, in paying property tax is, is helpful to us. So the project is the city just simply facilitating among all of these partners and asking them, can we all invest even putting some city dollars toward having one plan 
um, uh, that would help coordinate the development of this area over the next 20 years. Um, the city doesn't have a plan in mind. We just think there should be a plan and we're willing to act as the hub for all of these different community partners and even put some city dollars toward hiring a professional to develop that plan over the next 12 to 18 months. So just to clarify, um, not so much for the council because we've previously discussed it, but for anybody who's watching the meeting, city doesn't own any property there, um, but city sees potential there. If we all had a plan, each one of those community partners will be making infrastructure investments as time goes on, whether it's the football stadium or the Potter County baseball stadium, um, the Tri-State Fairground and the venue district, they make improvements every year to their buildings and things out there. But if they all had one plan and they knew they were all going in the same direction, um, I think it, we would benefit as a community more economically. Um, and that's really the idea behind it. So, and I, um, who are I just want to brag on Andrew too, by the way, I heard his presentation twice yesterday at both of those meetings. And uh, I'm very proud to have Andrew on our staff, not just for his podium presentation skills, but uh, for the work that he the work that he does behind the scenes, it's 99% um, his ability to execute and get things done and then bring them and do a presentation. So I'm very proud of, of Andrew and his work as we went to those two different meetings yesterday. Thank you. Councilman Member Powell. Okay. Um, who are the two entities that own property out there? Oh, so really the main two is Potter County and Amarillo ISD, but Potter County leases to the expo. Um, okay. to operate the majority of the land. Okay. And um, when, when do you all anticipate maybe visiting with the uh, Barrio uh, Neighborhood Association as well as the uh, Quarter Horse Association? Uh, speaking about Barrio, they've, they've actually been involved in the initial discussions that helped us kind of brainstorm and kick off this idea. And I know the mayors met with AQHA uh, as well. Mm -hmm. So those, those conversations okay. are already taking place. And would there be any other uh, neighborhood uh, associations that are, that would be participating in this particular project right now? Because the Barrio is probably the closest one that's closest to that area, I would think. Not that we've identified at this point, but it, it is kind of uniquely situated between the Barrio and the East Gateway tiers. So we'll, we'll continue to identify other stakeholders throughout that process. And we'll also want to involve the, the neighbors and the commercial district in that area because we're really looking outside the boundary of the, the areas owned by Potter County and um, AISD to get a really bigger view of what could take place in that area. And also our infrastructure, make sure we have water and, and sewer that can serve future development, some of those, those ideas. Right. Thank you. I'm excited about the project. I appreciate the information. Yes, ma'am. So just kind of a question. Um, I just remember growing up, there was a refinery across the street. I think it's Phillips 66 refinery. So does Philip 66 still own that land? And is that land in a state of, it needs a lot of cleanup before it could be, something could be done with it because that's a pretty big amount of acreage that could have some sort of an effect over a large period of time, I would think on this. I believe it's owned by, yeah, it's owned by Chevron now. Sorry, Andrew. I just wanted to identify where it is to the Northeast. Is that what you're saying, Eddie? Uh, definitely to the east. Yes, it's. I'm not so sure it's to the northeast, but yeah, to the east. Yes, I know they. I don't know what stage it is, but they are doing the remediation and some work on the site right now. Yes, I, Andrew, if I could, uh, there is a federal program in process on that property related to that refinery, so it's pretty much a, a difficult situation to look at in regards to development. Oh, I'm sure it is. We have that um, same Andrew, situation in the East Gateway tiers because the majority of it's in that zone as well. Yes, and Andrew, I just have one other question. Um, is the request for proposal, is that for a consultant or is that a 
Okay. Yes, for right. consultant. Thank you. Yes, and there's some, there's many out there that specialize in fairgrounds and expo districts. Um, so I've already received a couple of calls with people interested in submitting for it. Okay, anything else on that? Item 1E then is the Canadian River Municipal Water Authority update. And I know I saw Kent on the call earlier. Hi, Kent. Hello, hello. All right. Is that like Meredith behind you? It, yeah, it's cold out there, I'm telling you. <laughs> Let me see here, just one second. Okay. Well, thank you, Mayor and, and City Council. I was going to ask you, did the lake freeze over anywhere? I mean, is that what these pictures are showing us? It, uh, there you go. Okay. Can wow. you see that? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it, the whole upper end of the lake froze over. The rest of it is kind of smushy. Uh, I'm sorry, there's some latency in my computer for some reason for my network, so I may be talking over you sometimes. I apologize in advance for that. But anyway, I don't, did it get cold in Amarillo too? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it certainly did here. This is an, another view of that a little bit closer up, but uh, on the power side of this, we, we have an interim power rate with SPS. It saves us a lot of money annually. Uh, we have about an $8 million electric bill. And so having that interruptible rate helps us a lot. Uh, we keep the and Lubbock that if we run out of power, uh, the reservoir in Amarillo is a high spot. We can, we can continue to supply water. Uh, we keep those full just for times like this. Still so has to shut down several times during this last event, and that wasn't a problem for us at all. Our load is significant. If we were if we were running wide open, we'd use about as much power as Pampa and Border combined. So, so the internal it certainly helps us a lot too. Anytime during this, if anybody has any questions, don't hesitate to stop me. Our water supply is solid, uh, really because of the well field. Uh, this graph shows the chloride content of the lake. Uh, sorry. And uh, sorry. This graph shows the chloride content of the lake. You can see that it's trending upward. We had a big, big spike in, during the drought, peaked out in 12 there, nearly 1,900 parts per million chlorides. You can see this graph, the line at the bottom is our state standard, 300. You can also see the trend, even when you discount that, you can see that the trend is going upwards and that's just the way it's gonna be in Lake Meredith. Uh, because of that, we blend our, blend our water. We blend about, well, it just depends on the chloride content in the lake. When we got up to our very highest point, that 1900 parts per million in 2012, we could have only put in 7% uh, lake water. We didn't put any because just start and stop, starting and stopping those big motors is, is just uh, too hard on them and, and just not worth it for that kind of money. But right now, I mean, for that kind of water, right now we're about 700 parts per million in the lake. We're blending about 25 parts to 20, I mean, 20 to 25 percent lake water. Uh, that's not always, uh, it didn't have to be a bad thing. Uh, you can see, oops, a second, that didn't do right. You can see we had a, a little accident here a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the company putting in guardrail on top of the dam, drilled into our pipeline. That's really only a three inch hole there, but the water was blowing out about uh, oh, 150 feet high, something like that. We are back pumping again. We just started delivering lake water again today. Uh, the contractor's paying a $180,000 bill for this repair, but we are pumping water again today. That's a good thing. And I know that was quick. I only covered a few, a few issues, but I'd be happy to try to answer any questions anybody had. Council questions for Kent? Those pictures are fascinating, Kent. I'm, I'm really glad you brought pictures. 
I can't ever oh, remember seeing the lake frozen at all. I'm sure it has I, been before, but. I've been here 30 years and this is the first time I've seen it frozen to that extent. Uh, I've seen, you know, up in the bay it's frozen a little bit, but not out across the lake like that. It was just, right. it was just yeah. amazing. Yeah, I snapped a picture just so I could show my parents, make sure they saw that. <laughs> yeah, it, it was interesting. Uh, not on this subject, but I'd like to publicly say how great of a job Amarillo has done in getting the COVID, COVID vaccines out. It makes me proud to be a part of it in this area. You guys have done great. Well, thank you, Mr. City Manager. You say thank you on behalf of the big team that's done the work. Absolutely, yeah. Big team appreciates those kind words um, to the public yeah. who's sending the kind words you know, uh, on behalf of that team that's doing such great and long and hard work. You know, thank you. We really appreciate it. Any other questions that y'all want to throw Kent's way? No? Okay. Kent, keep up the good work. Uh, it's, it's the slow prodding kind of work that, you know, we should be patting you on the back that says thank you for managing all of this and um, we have because of the great freeze seen what life would look like not so much in the panhandle but in other parts of the state without some of the things we rely on every single day like electricity and water so thank you for standing watch on our wall um, that provides water for our region and for our city we really appreciate the work that you do you bet thank you Okay, last thing on the agenda, this portion of the agenda is item 1F, requesting future agenda items or reports from the city manager. Do you have anything here, council? Mayor, I had um, a couple of items. Um, one, I think it's a little too soon, but I wanna get it on the radar for when we get some information back on just all the investigations that are going on or just kind of what happened with our electric grid and Amarillo was very fortunate to ha not have near the problems the rest of the state did. But as we gather that information to, to hold a spot for getting information back, like from our state legislators or reports from our uh, utility providers to just explain um, everything that has been found and identified and corrections that are that are being made. And then um, number two is I wanted to request um, just a work agenda item uh, to look at our downtown parking garage revenue numbers, as well as our on street parking and have just a chance to kind of look at that, uh, look at the trends, look at the numbers and have a conversation about that. Okay. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I one, one clarification question on the on the first item, uh, Councilmember Hayes. Uh, what I have is to provide an update at some point on the uh, analysis that's going to take place regarding failures, uh, or or last week with regard to electric power. Now, what I wrote down was with regard the analysis that will take place regarding ERCOT because I don't think an analysis is going to be done by the state on SPP, which is our, our grid, or on, uh, I think there's one or two other grids that touch small parts of, of, of the state, like El Paso and the far, far east Texas is on a different grid. Uh, so uh, you're wanting an ana the analysis that the state is going, uh, an, an update on the analysis that the state is going to conduct regarding ERCON, is that correct? Well, I'd be interested in other feedback from council if they think that it would um, be of public interest on the whole state or really if it is just specifics of things that um, affected us in the panhandle. I for the area in regards to Southwestern Public Service Company, we are a part of the Southwest uh, Power Pool and have been for many years, which is a great decision that that we made and I don't remember remember the exact dates but it was probably in the maybe the 80s or 90s somewhere in there but I think that Southwestern Public Service Company XL Energy has done a great job especially last week and and uh, helping us get through the the winter storm so I, I think the biggest issues are with ERCOT that that's just my opinion that affected the uh, the entire 
I guess, south of the entire state. So is that, do I see Mr. Ronnie Walker on? Yes, you do. Yes. Uh, if, if I could say a few things. I uh, have to pause, you guys. And I, I know this is, but I'm probably looking at Brian, who is yeah. saying this is not really on our agenda to talk about. So, yeah. Ronnie, I, I love that you're on our call because you do have an agenda item that's not ERCOT specific. Right. Related. Yeah, but I just I just want to say this that uh, we are definitely working on uh, a presentation to be able to go around and and to visit with uh, companies and with people that are interested. And in, you know, we learned a lot on this deal. I mean, we learned a lot. Who would ever thought the whole seventy four percent of the United States was going to freeze below freezing for a week in the whole state of Texas? So done a lot of things. We've got a lot of good information, but we're going to put together a presentation. I hope to bring it to the council. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah, I would we'll, love Bonnie's presentation for sure. Yeah, based, on, based on what I'm hearing, we're going to focus on an analysis of what happened in our area that we can have uh, uh, Excel present or Ronnie present or whoever, Ronnie, you, you want to have uh, do that. But have that have you all present that to tell us what happened in, in our city and in our area. And I'm Looking sure we'll talk on, I mean, it will talk about statewide supply, which affected us here in the Panhandle area. But okay. Great. Glad you were on for this, Ronnie. That was helpful. You may have. Okay. Anybody else have agenda items? Okay. Let's take a bathroom break real quick and try to come right back and finish up the rest of our agenda before we go to executive session uh, as quickly as we can. Okay. Five minutes. Thank y'all. Okay, I think we're ready to pick back up with the consent agenda. Anything on there, Council, that needs to come off for questions or discussion? Okay, hearing nothing, do we have a motion on the consent agenda? Uh, yes, Mayor. I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Been moved by Council Member Powell and seconded by Council Member Sauer to approve the items on the consent agenda. All of those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, that passes with the 5 0 vote. Item 3A is to consider a resolution authorizing the City of Bamarillo to submit the fiscal year 2022 grant application for the Project Safe Neighborhood Program. Mr. City Manager. Hi, Mayor. Thank you. We have uh, uh, this is a FY22. Uh, project safe neighborhood application uh, that would uh, provide re uh, resources for regional real-time crime center. Uh, it's an application that would be made to the office of the governor. You recently saw an FY21, 2021 uh, application, a retroactive application for funding that had been made available to us uh, just a few weeks ago. So uh, uh, not to be confused with that one, this is another application for funds that will be provided to us through the office of the governor as another component of the project safe neighborhood program. Uh, we have Deputy City Manager Kevin Starbuck and Police Chief Martin Birkenfeld available to answer any questions Council might have. Any questions? All right, doesn't look like we have any, Chief. Thank you for joining us, though. Do we have a motion on this item? Uh, yes, Mayor. I move to approve the resolution to authorize the City of Amarillo to submit project uh, 4088002 Regional Real Time Crime Center to the Office of the Governor uh, through the Physical Year 2022 Project Safe Neighborhood Grant Program. And that's going to be in the amount of $105,000 for equipment. Second. It's been moved by Council Member Powell and seconded by Council Member Sauer to approve this grant application. Any further questions or discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. That passes with the 5-0 vote. Item 3B is to consider a resolution regarding, um, well, I won't read it all. You guys can read it all. It's really long there. But it's about a rate a rate increase um, in for XL utilities. So, Mr. City Manager. All right, Mayor. Uh, I'm going to walk us through a pretty detailed explanation on item B, uh, which is uh, a surcharge related to a uh, uh, Excel rate case. The uh, item C is also dealing with uh, a different rate case uh, uh, with Excel. So I want to walk you through this. Ronnie Walker's on the call as well. 
be important to note, uh, uh, and, and this is a very, anytime we deal with Excel rate cases, we're going to walk through these types of explanations. We always have Ronnie Walker or somebody else from Excel with us on these calls or meetings, because it's important for everyone to know that, that we are partners and we recognize each other as vital and critical partners for each other's success. Uh, uh, that said, the, the discussion on rates and how you set rates is always something that's very complicated. We use consultants to, to help us through that. Uh, uh, and, and because we are going through rate cases, does not, it should not be uh, interpreted as a, uh, uh, a difficult relationship or an, uh, uh, anything untoward with regard to how we work with Excel. We are very critical partners with each other. We know that and we recognize that. And nothing says it more than last week. So let me walk us through item B. Uh, item B is a surcharge that's authorized as a result of the 2019 rate case uh, that was filed by Excel in September of 2018. I'm sorry, in September of 2019. It didn't receive final resolution through the PUC until September, until late in August of, uh, or maybe September 1st of 2020. So the rate that was approved by the PUC on September 1st, 2020, is then retroactively applied through a reachback, which is what this surcharge allows X, uh, uh, Excel to, to recover the revenue that would have been re, uh, received if they had applied the rate that was approved in September of 2020 throughout that entire time from the time they submitted the rate uh, uh, change request in September of 2019. So that's somewhat confusing, but it has nothing to do with any, it does not pay for any previous rate case projects, which would include uh, uh, wind farms and other things, uh, nor does it have anything to do with our current rate case, which is what we're gonna be discussing in item C. So that's somewhat confusing. Ronnie does a great job of explaining any, any questions you might have. I've also got a number of people on the city that have been working on these projects, including uh, city attorney, Brian McWilliams and uh, assistant city manager, Laura Storrs. Uh, myself and, and anybody else that's that's needed for any questions. So is there any questions that I, Ronnie, or anybody else can answer for you? So just to clarify that, let me restate it and see if I understand it ex correctly. Um, so it sounds like when a rate proposal is brought forward and then negotiations begin, there's kind of like a, a marker put down that says, okay, Here's the starting point. And while we work through all these issues, it allows then a, a point to go back, not before that, but at that starting point of when negotiations um, had begun on that rate request, say, this is what we settled on, this is the new rate, and this is when it becomes effective. So that it, it builds time in for both sides that you have actually um, when that rate's agreed upon, that you're able to go back and apply it retroactively. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Well, let me just let me just say that, okay, the 2019 case, we filed it August the 8th of 2019. And then 35 days after that, after the filing day, which was September the 12th oh. of 2019, that is that date where we... Uh, mark as the starting of this uh, reach back period, September the 12th. So we actually settled in August, but we the new rates went into effect September 1st of 2020, okay? So that period from September the 12th of 19 to August the 31st of 2020, which is one day before the rates went into effect, that's the reach back period. And, and those rates that are approved actually goes to the kilowatt hours used over that period of time plugged in and comes up with uh, with that number, which is 70, 71.5 million, something like that. And that's going to be implemented in a, a 12 month period starting April 1st, 2021 to March 31st, 2022. So, so the service will go away. Yes, that goes away. Definitely a complicated process about a complicated subject. It is. Any other questions? Thank you for being here to answer questions, Ron. Thanks. And one thing, I just want to 
Excel, we really appreciate you guys, the city and our community partners last week, working through that storm, uh, the conservation efforts that, that we asked and you guys did. It was, you know, it kept us, it kept us from having some extended outages that we would have had. And so we come out pretty good on that deal, but it wouldn't have been without the community stepping up, our community partners stepping up. And, you know, that's, that's what always happens when in Amarillo, when there's a time of need, people step up. So thank y'all. Well said, and we would pat you guys on the back as well. All those guys that go out to work the lines uh, in the wee hours of the night and the morning and in the sub-zero temperatures and the high winds and the wet conditions and all of that, uh, you know, we all we do is walk over and flip on the switch. We don't often stop and thank you for the dangers that they face in making our switches effective. And definitely those conditions are very dangerous and you guys stepped up and, and we're working that situation. I'll also just thank you for the partnership relationally that um, our organization, the city has with Excel. Uh, and I saw that on display in multiple meetings last week as we were cruising through the storm. Um, but part of the reason why it was an effective ask out to the community who did a great job of conserving energy was because those partnerships were in place and y'all could transparently, you know, give the information and there were good conduits there for it and we could conduit that information out to citizens. So um, thank you for the work that you do to build that relationship and maintain that relationship, both with our emergency operations folks and city manager and uh, Kevin Starbuck and everybody under his um, watch in the city. Those, those relationships have to be there when we need them in a crisis, but they don't just pop up. They're there because you guys do a good job building and maintaining them when, when it's well, not. Well, so does the city. So the, the city does also. They do an awesome job. I mean, they're uh, definitely our, our favorite partner for sure. I mean, they're always there when we need them. All I got to do is call. So, and same here. Mayor, I wanted to, if I could, I'd like to add just a little bit on top of what you said. Uh, you know, it's not just Ronnie. Uh, we had uh, Brad Baldridge, who's a key person on the operations side for Excel in our emergency operations center for days. And in the evening, sometimes on the phone, texting us updates on what's going on with the power grid here. Uh, uh, we also had David Hudson personally giving us calls, who's, you know, the, the main person in charge out at Excel here in Amarillo. And uh, so at every level, uh, we really appreciate it. And then yeah. beyond that, we all recognize the sacrifices that the men and women make up your team uh, made out in deadly cold weather, uh, uh, taking care of uh, infrastructure that failed as a result of the ice. And it wasn't a lot, uh, but that's tough work. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Council, do we have a, go ahead, Howard, yes. I just want to say thank you also. I have a son in Dallas, had a totally different experience than Amarillo. No yeah. son in Waco had a totally different experience. When it's 40 degrees in the house for over 24 hours, that gets pretty tough. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. They have some extended outages for sure. I'm just glad we didn't. We, we left out on the ice situation. We didn't have the ice. We had the extreme cold. And it kind of, it wasn't a gradual, it, it just like flipping a switch, it got cold. And that, that helped us more than anything because ice kills us, ice cripples us, cripples a power company. Nothing like it, nothing worse. So we lucked out on that, that fact, but we learned a lot too. <laughs> and we will be sharing that with you guys. Looking forward to that. Thank you, Ronnie. Yeah. Uh, okay, do we have a motion council on this item? Uh, yes, Mayor. I move to approve the resolution approving the surcharge related to docket number 49831 submitted by Southwestern Public Service Company on or about mm -hmm. December 18th, 2020, authorizing participation in a correlation of similarly uh, situated cities known as the Alliance of Excel Municipalities authorizing participation in related rate proceedings, requiring the reimbursement of municipal rate case expenses and authorizing the retention of, of a special council. Second. It's been moved by council member Pound, seconded by council member Smith. 
to approve item 3B. Any further discussion or questions from the council? All those in favor, please raise your hand. I see five hands. That motion passes with the 5 0 vote. Item 3C, Mr. City Manager. Hey, Mayor. Uh SPS has filed a, and this is regarding our current rate case that was filed on February 8th of 2021. We have uh, 90 days uh, to either suspend or deny. Uh, otherwise the, the, the rate request would go into effect as, as submitted to the city of Amarillo and the PUC. Uh, there's a number of cities that uh, uh, this, rate this rate case has been submitted to in addition to the PUC, in addition to the city of Amarillo. Uh, we have options to either deny or suspend, as I mentioned, uh, we are recommending that we suspend uh, the rate case application so that we can, as we have in the past two uh, rate cases since I've been here, uh, work with uh, SPS and uh, through consultants to fully understand uh, the rate case request and negotiate that request to the best, uh, to best serve our rate payers uh, uh, here in Amarillo. Uh, Ronnie, is there anything else I need to add there? Uh, no, Jared, of course, we can't talk about it too much, but uh, no, it's uh, that was filed February the 8th. Uh, we filed that. Now, March 15th is that effective date for this? Correct. Uh, yeah, for this filing. So we'll be, you know, whatever happens, we'll get a surcharge on it later. So when it settles, but no, so great job, the, Jared. The recommendation is to suspend. This is the recommendation that has been uh, sent to us by our. Uh, consultant who works with us on these items. Uh, it is consistent with what we've done in previous rate cases. Uh, so uh, I, I or Ronnie or anybody else can answer any questions you might have, understanding that uh, Ronnie is somewhat limited in what he can say uh, because of his role in this at, at, at this point. Let me just say that uh, we do have 81 communities, 81 cities, and they have original jurisdiction over their rates, SPS rates. So each one of these 81 cities has to do the same thing. They have to take this before the council. And um, we, we, most of the time we recommend that they, the smaller communities, we recommend they deny it because then they don't have to go back and, and do anything else. If you suspend it, it gives you 90 days, but you still have to act on it in 90 days. You have to go in and deny it. You don't want to approve it. If you ever approve it, then the rates as submitted automatically go into effect then. So I don't think... I've never heard of anybody that's done that. So um, it's not a good deal, but anyway. Any other questions? Okay, we have a motion with regard to item 3C. Uh, yes, Mayor, I move to approve the resolution suspending the effective date of Southwestern Public Service Company's proposed increase in rates and allowed by statute declaring temporary rates authorizing the city's continued participation, participation with other cities in the alliance of XL municipalities to direct the activities of lawyers and consultants. Thank you. It's been moved by council member Powell and seconded by council member Smith to approve item 3C. Do we have any further discussion or questions from the council? Hearing none, all of those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Okay, it passes with the 5-0 vote. Um, thanks again for being with us, Ronnie. Yeah, thank you all, appreciate it. Item 3D is um, a report and considering the receiving and accepting of the comprehensive annual financial report, Mr. City Manager. Yes, ma'am, we had a uh, presentation uh, to the city's uh, audit committee uh, last week on the 16th uh, from our finance department as well as our auditor. Uh, Janie Arnold was on the call, so I'm going to throw it to Laura Storrs first, our assistant city manager and chief financial officer to make any introductory comments and then to hand it over to uh, Janie. Uh, Laura? Or to do the presentation yourself. We've got Janie here to answer questions. I can't remember who, which of y'all is doing the presentation, but it was a long, very exhaustive and extensive and in-depth meeting uh, last week to go through our uh, annual financial report. Laura? All right, thank you, Jared. And maybe first want to start with a big thank you to the audit committee. Um, they ventured out in the snow and the cold weather to come up to City Hall and sit through about an hour and a half presentation related to our financials. So um, Dr. Sauer and um, Councilmember Hayes, 
we really appreciate you all. Y'all are such troopers for coming out and helping us meet our deadlines related to these audited financial statements. Um, these statements, um, they're about a 300 page document and to go through them and hit the highlights, um, we, were going, we were moving very quickly in an hour and a half, but think that we covered some great ground and um, answered a lot of very good questions that came up through it. So I'm gonna share a quick presentation here um, and wanted just to start out with maybe a, a, some more thank yous um, related to our audited financial statement. Um, we have a, a large team that works on um, our financials uh, all year long. And then, as you know, we are now in February talking about financial statements that ended on September 30th of 2020. So we have been working with auditors um, nonstop since September, trying to close out the books, make final adjustments, and present audited financial statements. So a big thank you to Debbie Reed, who is our new finance director. She came actually right at the end of our fiscal year, but was involved in our audit process. Um, thank you to Valerie Kuhnert, who is our city auditor, and Matt Poston, who is our assistant city auditor. Those two and their team were instrumental in putting together all of our audited financial statements. Um, we have about 12 degreed accountant positions, and included in that is four CPAs, and we're always looking to expand that. So have a lot of expertise here at the city, um, which really helps um, this audit go smoothly. We also want to thank Janie Arnold. She's on this call as well. Um, she is the um, partner with CMMS CPAs and Advisors. And she is in charge of the city's audit. And she had a large team that worked um, as well. And this year was different because they were working remotely, but we all feel like it went very well. It was a new experience for us. We learned a lot and learned a lot of efficiencies that can even be achieved with them working remotely and us just sending more things um, through an electronic means. So it was certainly a learning experience this year. Um, the CAFR, and each of the council members should have a copy of the CAFR. Um, there's a couple of items in it that I want to go over. Um, we did tab these drafted um, financial statements, and then there is, it's kind of like a cheat sheet inside your um, audited financial statements there that gives you some highlights on each of those numbered tabs throughout your financial statements. Um, once these are approved by council, we will put an electronic copy on the city's website and have a link out there that um, the citizens can um, go and look through this document as well. There's some great information in it. So the first thing I wanted to cover is that um, our CAFR receives the Certificate of Achievement in Excellence and Financial Reporting from the Government Finance Officers Association and we have received it 44 years in a row. And so we've had a long um, experience, we've had a long um, successful experience with our audited financial statements in meeting the standards put out by the GFOA. And we will be submitting this CAFR as well um, for that same award. Inside um, your audited financial statements, there is um, on the first page in the actual document, page one, there is a financial statement opinion. And that is probably one of the most important items related to these financial statements. Um, we received an unmodified, which is a clean opinion. That is the best opinion that you can receive from your auditor. So we're really excited to report that. There's also a letter that was included in your financial statements in that front cover as well. And it's a report on internal controls over financial reporting. And it discloses that there is, um, there's no findings of non-compliance that the auditors found. Um, at the very back of your audited financial statements, we included a copy of our single audit report. There is a separate audit that's done over all of our state and federal grant awards. You will notice as you flip through this, we received um, or we spent $45.7 million um, last fiscal year in federal and state grant expenditures. And so the auditors have separate audit processes that are put in place to audit those expenditures. 
And you will see there's also a compliance, a report on compliance and internal controls over the major programs. And we also received an unmodified, um, which is a clean opinion on our single audit. Um, so with that, again, a very high level overview um, of our financial statements. Um, I will stop sharing my screen now and ask council if you have any questions for us or um, if Janie, um, if y'all have any questions for Janie Arnold, she is also on this call with us as well. Council, questions? Councilmember Hayes, comments? Uh, Dr. Sauer and I got to meet Debbie Reed in person for the first time. That was nice to, you know, with all the COVID, we just hadn't been able to officially face-to-face -face welcome her. And uh, she was a great part of the team having there at the table and just hearing her, her feedback as well, just also being able to compare to some other cities. And um, it was very encouraging hearing her take on how our financials compare to a lot of other cities. And you know, our, our finances are just really strong. Our debt ratios, our unfunded liabilities uh, that just are so in such excellent financial position that helped us keep that um, bond rating during very uncertain times. And those are things that, um, you know, Mary, you talk so much about uh, looking long-term and setting policies in place. And these are policies that have been in place in our finance department for decades and it, it paid off in a crisis. And it's, um, it, it's very comforting seeing the team and who Jared has built back and put back together uh, this new team going forward to uh, continue to continue on the same track. Uh, Dr. Sauer, anything you want to add to that? Um, you know, one of the things that I would add to that was that I would piggyback off of um, really what Elaine said was, uh, you know, there's been some talk about the hot tax and about how the hot tax had dropped off significantly because hotel occupancy, you know, basically plummeted during the height of the COVID uh, thing during last year. But the interesting thing is, is even at our worst, um, the debt coverage didn't even come close to what was considered the minimum. So our debt coverage, uh, it just is a, uh, it's another precedent or it's another way to say that the accounting department, that the city has done an incredibly good job of, yes, we made this investment in Hodgetown and we said that we would do well even if things got bad. And so guess what? Things got bad and we didn't even come close to what the minimum would be required in an effort for us to keep, up, keep our AAA bond rating. Uh, so um, that's very impressive. Uh, you know, we're going to be moving forward. The sky's going to be the limit at this point in time. So I just like seeing the fact that we had some difficulties that we faced. Um, our financial department and everybody here at the city, they had things already in place. They had everything in place so that we did not have to worry. And that's one of the things that I want the citizens to realize you don't have to worry is that we have everything taken in place, uh, taken care of, and we are very much in the black and uh, we are very much moving forward. Um, I was very impressed with sitting through this. Um, my head swim for a little bit, uh, trying to figure out all the stuff that they were saying. Um, and, but the end result was, um, it was very comforting to find out that we are in an incredibly strong position uh, coming out of COVID and starting 2021. Uh, and it will be a very productive year for the city. Yeah, that our, our policies um, are strong, our systems are strong and individuals, but then also it just reflected the strength of our local economy. That was very encouraging, just seeing how um, we had rebounded so quickly and how some of our numbers came back up. And um, it was, uh, uh, oh, I remember there was one other thing that stood out to me, that there is a rotation process too of where they do um, on just a rotating basis each year, they do a deep dive 
on top of all the other audit and just really um, uh, with fine tooth comb going through different departments and uh, that uh, it's very, uh, I like that system. I like the rotation and the, uh, the fact that uh, above and beyond already the audit process we're doing of how that rotation works to look at individual departments in a cycle. <clears throat> Good comments. Well, I will echo what Laura said. The rest of the council appreciates the work that the two of you did to uh, serve on the audit committee. And we appreciate your time. We appreciate your expertise. Both of you guys um, enjoy working with numbers. And so we're thankful that you're willing to do this duty for us. Any other questions from council or questions for Jamie? Jamie, thank you for being with us today. And we appreciate the fact that uh, you and your firm take this on for us every year and uh, do a great job, even amidst the year of changing and doing things virtually this year. And I also would like to thank everyone that assisted us with the audit. It's a team effort, isn't it? It definitely is. Yeah. Uh, well, Councilmember Sauer or Councilmember Hayes, either one of you want to make a motion on this item? Elaine, you want to go ahead? Because <laughs> I don't have it sitting in front of me right now. I've got to figure out where I left it. I can do it, Mayor. Okay, go for it. You know how to do that without free to jumping in. It's like, wait, wait, I need to read this paper. <laughs> yeah. I'll, do, I'll go ahead. I, I found uh, the I know. Uh, Mayor, I move to uh, approve receiving and accepting the City of Amarillo Comprehensive Annual Financial Report for the year ending September 30th, 2020. Second. It's been moved by Councilmember Powell and seconded by Councilmember Hayes to approve and to receive and accept uh, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report for uh, the year ending 2020. Any further discussion or questions about the motion? Hearing none, the, uh, if you're in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Okay, passes with the 5-0 vote. Jamie, thank you. I don't know how much time you take off before you start working on it again, but probably not much given the size of the project. Well, again, thank you. Laura, we appreciate the work that you and your team and Debbie, um, Matt, everything you guys do to keep us on track. What Councilwoman Hayes said about how it saves us money and what Dr. Sauer said about how it builds trust with our citizens, both of which are very important. Um, you know, the AAA bond rating saved citizens almost $2 million just in our 2016 bond issuances. So um, we're able to get projects done for less money because of the work that y'all do day in and day out and year over year. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate that. I know the team takes a lot of pride in the work they do, and it makes me very honored to be a part of that team. Yeah, they should. We're proud of them, too. Uh, item 3E is to discuss and consider the sale of real estate located at Farmers Avenue and South Georgia Street to XL Energy. Mr. City Manager. Hi, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, as you said, this is uh, to consider the approval of sale of AEDC land uh, that's uh, uh, adjacent to a larger tract of land owned by AEDC, and this sale is going to facilitate uh, future development of this area. Uh, we have uh, President and uh, CEO of AEDC, um, Kevin Carter, with us. Kevin, can you pop? There he is. Kevin, uh, take Thank it away. Mayor, Council. Thank you, Jared. Um, this uh, agenda item would uh, be to discuss and consider the sale of real estate located at Farmers Avenue and South Georgia Street uh, to XL Energy. Uh, this is a picture of the property, kind of gives you an overview. We own 195 acres. Uh, this is our South Georgia business park in Randall County. We purchased that land in 2019 at a price of uh, $19,724 per acre. XL came to us a few months back and asked about uh, purchasing a couple of acres to expand the substation that currently is in the green shaded area. And so the, the piece of land that they're looking at that they would purchase uh, is the blue shaded area. 
that would give us the capacity or give Excel the capacity to uh, expand capacity to that business park and also to the residents residents that are around that area. So Excel, um, we would propose a price of twenty thousand dollars per acre, so forty thousand um, dollars total purchase price um, for the two acres that Excel is proposing to buy. Any questions about that, Council? And Mayor, the AEDC board voted yesterday on a 5 0 vote to uh, approve the sale. Okay. We don't have any questions for the EDC team. Do we have a motion on this item? Uh, yes, Mayor, we do. I move to authorize the Emerald Economic Development Corporation to execute a contract in all necessary documents for the sale of approximately uh, two acres of land located at Farmers Avenue and South Georgia Street in Amarillo, Texas to XL Energy to expand their substation. And that would be in the amount of $40,000 plus closing costs and related expenses. Second. Moved by Council Member Powell and seconded by Council Member Sauer to approve item 3E. Any discussion or questions on the motion? Okay, hearing none, all of those in favor, please raise your hand. That passes with the 5-0 vote. Uh, EDC team, thank you. We'll see you over in executive session. At this time, this uh, completes our agenda for non-executive session items, and I would request the city attorney to read our special language. Glad to, Mayor. Pursuant uh, to means that closed session of the Emerald City Council was announced on February the 23rd, 2021 at 3.06 p.m. under the following authority, section 551.072, discuss the purchase exchange, lease, sale of value, real property, public discussion, such would not be in the best interest of the city's bargaining position. Section 551.074, discuss the appointment, appointment, and valuation duties of public officer and employee. Section 551.087, discuss commercial financial information received from existing business or business prospects with which the city is negotiating for the location or retention of a facility or for incentives the city is willing to extend or financial information submitted by the same. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Okay, we appreciate your tuning in for uh, our meeting today and we're adjourned to executive session.